Well, hi there. Welcome to Wilderness Wildlife Week. This is number 30, and this one's being done a little bit differently. There's not people all over the place. There's, I'm in a room with one person. Anyway, uh, my name is Stephen Lynn Bales. I'm a local naturalist. I uh, worked for 20 years as a naturalist educator in Knoxville at Imes Nature Center. And I have been part of Wilderness Wildlife Week probably for 12 to 15 years. I'd have to go back at my records and look when I first started. I'm also an author for the University of Tennessee Press. I've written three books on nature and natural history for UT Press. It's uh, Nature is My Life. Um, I grew up in Gatlinburg, which is why nature is kind of my life. I'm lucky to have grown up with uh, a national park roughly five, a half a mile from my childhood home. So I spent a lot of time exploring the park as a kid, exploring the park as a teenager, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's probably grown up in Gatlinburg and with that background of a national park that turned me early into being a, a naturalist, a natural historian, a nature lover, if that's okay. And uh, even when I had other kinds of jobs, I was always thinking about nature and <laughs> too much so. Some My friends might say too much so. Uh, for a while, I was a photographer for the local newspaper. Back then, it was the Gallenberg Press. Now it's the Mountain Press and even did some writing for them. Uh, so I had been a photographer and kind of a documenter all of that time. And when I retired, uh, from Imes two years ago, one of the first topics I really wanted to explore more, um, and that's what you do when you retire, you just refocus your energies, was the uh, was metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is this incredibly wonderful natural event that happens all around us. Uh, and we'll start with um, some better visuals and just looking at me. Anyway, um, Albert Einstein, and everyone knows Einstein as a scientist, a physicist, a brilliant thinker. He was also a bit of an atheist, but I love this quote from him. There are only two ways to live your life, as though nothing is a miracle or as though everything is a miracle. And to me, everything out there is an absolute miracle. Uh, the more you look, the deeper you look, the more fascinating it is. And uh, with life on Earth, 80 to 90 percent of all life on Earth, if you can believe this, is insects. And so, uh, and of that 80 to 90 percent of life on Earth, 45 to 60 percent go through complete metamorphosis. And by complete metamorphosis, they start out in one form and gradually change to a totally different form. In the case of the visual there, they start out as a caterpillar, caterpillar or larva. Then they uh, become um, uh, a pupa inside a chrysalis, or in some cases a cocoon if you're a moth. And then you emerge ultimately as a winged adult. And it's like, how is that even possible? How can all of that happen? That's incredible. Complete metamorphosis, just some of the things that are living around your house, out in your yard, beetles, bees, wasps, ants, fleas, mosquitoes, moths, and butterflies. Butterflies are the ones that get most of the attention because they're colorful, they're active during the day, that means they're di di diurnal. Moths are nocturnal, we don't see them as much. Uh, they tend to be more drab colors. We tried to ignore the mosquitoes. And I grew up, uh, my father in Gallenberg was a beekeeper, so I kind of grew up with bees. But here's where it gets scary. Here's where it gets sad. If you uh, are a subscriber to National Geographic, as I have been for many, many years, this was the last June issue of National Geographic. And it has a detailed story of the decline of flying insects. And in some parts of the world, populations of flying insects have decreased by 70%. 70%. That's an incredible thing to get your mind around. There's a wonderful book out there called uh, Moth Snowstorm, written by a British naturalist. And he describes the same kind of phenomena in um, the UK. 
that insects are slowly, flying insects are slowly disappearing. And he described, he called it a moth snowstorm because there was a time if you drove anywhere at night and with your headlights on the car, it was like you're driving into a snowstorm. There'd be so many flying insects out there. And I clearly remember the same thing. In the 1960s, of driving to Florida to visit my grandparents at night along 441, and dad would have to get out of the car every now and then just to clean the insects, the bugs, off the windshield. That no longer happens. We don't have that many insects out there. So, Of all those insects, like I said earlier, butterflies tend to be the ones that get the most attention. And there are 17,500 species of in, uh, butterfly in the world currently. That's a phenomenal number. And here in the United States are 750 species of butterfly. 750 species. Now, as, as I just said, we are documenting that some of the species are starting to decline. Ah, here's one of the great heroes in my life. His name's Oliver Dutillo. His mom, mother is Claire Dutillo, who is now the education naturalist at Seven Islands Birding Park uh, along the French Broad River. And Oliver was the one that first taught me how and showed me how to catch a monarch butterfly and to put a tag on it. Uh, my, uh, Oliver and his family are volunteers for Tremont. And every fall they take part in... Um, citizen science or community science effort to find, to catch monarchs that are migrating through uh, Cades Cove and to put tags on them. This is a wonderful program at three months started by a wonderful local naturalist named Wanda DeWard. She started the program of tagging monarchs to get a general sense of numbers, if nothing else, uh, in 1998. So Wanda's been there all along. And as soon as I retired, I volunteered to become part of the program. I'm now a facilitator in the fall uh, uh, to go out and catch monarchs and tag monarchs there in Cave Cove. It's beautiful. It's wonderful there. And on good days, the groups can catch 100 or more monarchs. My, dad, my groups tend to tag, catch something like 10 or 12. But we also look for other butterflies, too. And that kind of started, in, that started me thinking, we have documented that monarchs are declining. Monarch butterflies are in two groups in this country. Uh, the Western population that flies basically down the Pacific coast, that number has dropped 97%. That's an estimated number just since the 1980s. So there's a monster decline in monarchs in the West. And then here our Eastern population monarchs have dropped, they think roughly 80% in numbers just in the past 15 years. Uh, if you follow the news, the monarch news, they, uh, they were presented to become uh, an endang put on the endangered species list at the end of last year because of those huge drops in numbers. But they was declined only because it's the first year on it and uh, they're on a waiting list. And right now there's 161 other species of life that's on that waiting list before the monarchs. We can hope that monarchs will eventually get on the uh, endangered species list and protect it. But they got this back to the topic of metamorphosis. Oliver was, I think, in the photograph, he was roughly 10 years old when he took me in hand and taught me how to catch and tag a monarch in Cade's Cove. And I was roughly 10 years old in Gatlinburg when I first started thinking about metamorphosis. Many of you will recognize this caterpillar. Many of you will scream when you see this caterpillar. This is an eastern tent worm. They build their, the caterpillars weave a nest in um, a wild cherry tree. Their mom has laid eggs, a group of eggs in the fork of a tree, and they will build their nest in there and uh, lay their eggs. And in the spring when it hatches, they keep spinning the, the nest, the protective nest, higher and higher while they come out at night and um, forage around. Now, I've had people that would call me and say, I want to burn that nest down. I want to soak it in kerosene. I'm going to burn it out. I don't want them. But in truth, don't do that. Where not that many ever survive. It's basically also a living, a bird feeder with living food. Birds 
come in and they start tearing the nest out. Only the bulk of the moths, I read someplace that maybe one or two uh, caterpillars makes it out of that nest to form a cocoon. And when I was 10 years old, I found several of the caterpillars and put it in a wooden box with screen wire on both sides. I wanted to see what it became. This was the 1960s in Gallimore. Uh, we did not have the internet. <laughs> we just had to figure things out on our own. So I put these in the box and waited. The caterpillars wove a little cocoon. They are moths. And that's, the, that's an adult Eastern tent worm moth. Kind of a drab moth, but that's all moth, not all moth. But many moths are kind of drab. So that was kind of my first lesson in metamorphosis. I, um, after I read the article in um, National Geographic a year ago, I started wanting to document other species. We're going to get to a minute where I've documented monarchs. But I wanted to start looking for and get a general sense of population of some of the other species of butterflies that are around my home, around my area. I currently live in Knoxville and document their metamorphosis. The one I, this is the one that everybody loves and uh, sees. It's the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. I did find several of these adults flying around. I actually thought I saw several females laying eggs on a host plant. And it's important to know that every, um, Butterfly has a host plant or a group of plants, and the female only lays her eggs on one uh, on the host plant. Because the young ones, when they first hatch, the lower of the caterpillars, that's the plant they will eat. They won't eat. They won't eat everything. So uh, I would notice a lot of these around my house, but I have tulip trees. You notice the host plant: tulip trees, wild cherry, sweet bay magnolia are three that you search for. What I was doing, I was looking for eggs. I wanted to start with the egg of an eastern tiger swallowtail. Didn't find any because <laughs> all the adults I saw were 30 to 50 feet off the ground. And I really didn't want to climb the tree to look for a tiny little egg on a leaf. So this one I had to kind of go, okay, maybe I won't, maybe I won't study, maybe I won't document metamorphosis of an eastern tiger swallowtail just yet. Then I started, uh, but this is what I would have found. This is the caterpillar, which uh, to all the world to me looks like a dollop of bird goo. And I'm sure that's on purpose. That's why it survives way up there in the top of the tree. And look at the chrysalis it forms. It looks like part of the tree itself. We talk about perfect camouflage, both as a caterpillar and as a chrysalis. It's amazing. I never thought saw any of that yet. I will look. I did, next sent my uh, sights on zebra swallowtails. Zebra swallowtails are the Tennessee state butterfly, for one thing, and their host plant is pawpaws. Pawpaws tend to grow a little closer to the ground, closer to the terra firma. And in Knoxville, I know of several pawpaw patches. My first book, I write about pawpaws because it's one of my favorite local trees. And But I had zero luck in finding eggs. Eggs, again, are tiny. It's like... It's like finding the needle in a haystack, or now it's more like finding the needle in an empty field. It's they're difficult to find because they're so small. But I haven't given up because I know I know where they're at. They're somewhere on pawpaw trees. I just gotta catch it. But this is what a, uh, a zebra swallowtail caterpillar looks like, and that, again, that's what the chrysalis looks like. It looks like a dead leaf hanging from the tree. So I'm getting better. My new target is probably zebra, zebra swallowtails this year. Another wonderful butterfly, we would see a lot of these at Cades Cove last fall when we were uh, tagging Monarch, is common buckeye. It looks like they've got the spots that look as big as a buck's eye. But look at the, and look at the host plants. Blue toad flax, plantain, false foxglove, Mexican petunia, Firecracker, crudweed. I had to really look up for crudweed. I'd never heard of it. Most of those are not natives. They're really kind of uh, uh, moved here from Mexico and, uh, and uh, the Central America. We found a lot last fall of the adult butterflies, but I really didn't have time at that point to look for eggs. But this is what I would have found if I'd have found the caterpillar. Most caterpillars are kind of bristly to scare away uh, intruders. Um, birds, pre, uh, predators, and the, and, the caterp and the chrysalis itself looks like a dead leaf just hanging there. 
Oh, this is amazing. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. Uh, another butterfly. I would see, I saw several of these, but I never were able to find eggs. Because look at the host plants, stinging nettle and false stinging nettle. They, those plants sting. They actually do sting. I, I found one plant. I started searching for maybe eggs of red admirals. And the next thing, it felt like I'd stepped into a, a yellow jacket's nest. And it irritates. It's scratchy. It just... So they have they have uh, they have discovered a host plant that has built-in predator protection. You don't want to go messing around with a stinging nettle unless you're wearing gloves. But that's a red admiral. This is what the caterpillar looks like, and this is what the chrysalis looks like. Again, uh, looks like a dead leaf just hanging from a tree or a branch. You never would even pay pay it mind at all. You would hardly notice it. Who's left? Oh, painted ladies. Painted ladies, another wonderful uh, butterfly that we have in East Tennessee. And these um, thistles are a little bit easier to find, particularly in the summertime, although it's not a native plant. It's a little easier to find. But mallows, hollyhock, and legumes, that's, uh, that's the other host plant that the females lay their eggs on. Now, I should also mention that they tend to pollinate on all different kinds of things. It's only the host plants that the that the female will lay her eggs on because only the host plant is what her caterpillars will eat. Uh, this is what a painted lady uh, caterpillar look like. I've yet to find one. And this is what the chrysalis, chrysalis itself looks like. Uh, again, it's incredible. Ah. This is, uh, we'll go backtrack a little bit. I started this journey of metamorphosis in 2019, and I was really wanting to document monarch butterflies first. Um, and this is before I was even aware their populations were dropping so much. But a female monarch butterfly will lay her eggs one at a time on the bottom of a, a milkweed leaf. They prefer common milkweed. They'll also lay on butterfly uh, uh, butterfly weed and also on swamp weed. Those are all in the milkweed family. And they're called milkweeds because the toxins inside the leaf. See, the leaf doesn't want to be eaten. The plant doesn't want to be eaten. So it produces a toxin that's milky and sticky. And it's a cardiac uh, glycoside, glycoside, which is toxic. And but monarchs have developed over the years, they've evolved to be able, their young ones can eat the toxic uh, milkweed leaf and and take in the toxic uh, uh, glycoside. And um, each one grows up just like their mom wants. Each one of the caterpillars and subsequent butterflies grows up to be toxic. They are filled with milkweed. And I think all moms want their kids to be left alone and maybe even be a little toxic. So this is, but common milkweed is fairly easy to find. It's tall. It's a six foot tall plant that gets these wonderful bulbous uh, flowers uh, on it uh, during the year. And I was driving along a road off John Sevier Highway. And there in the ditch, in the wet ditch, in the muddy ditch, was a nice stand of milkweed, common milkweed. Now, ah, maybe I'll get lucky. Again, I'm looking for a tiny, tiny egg on the underside of a plant. Now, a monarch only lays one egg per leaf, um, and it's on the underside of the leaf. So I parked the car and waded out into the kind of muck and very quickly found an egg. I was shocked. It's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. So I brought it home to document. I finally had a test subject to bring home. Uh, and there's the egg. It's about this, see how hard to find? It's about the size of a, a pinhead. Now a female can lay 500. I've seen sources that say they can lay 1,000. Let's just say a female can lay a lot of eggs, but she only lays them one at a time and each one on the bottom of a milkweed leaf. So I had, I finally had a test subject where I could photograph the whole process of uh, metamorphosis. That was my goal. It's my first goal of retirement, you might say. For scale, I laid in a dime, 
uh, FDR is key. I want to keep key. Now, I didn't say I, when you're retired, you do have some time on your hands, but I simply didn't have time to sit there and watch this egg day after day after day after day. So I decided I'd let FDR watch it for a while, and he was being very protective. I labeled this day one. I had no idea when the egg had been laid, and they can be inside the egg up to four days. But when I noticed the egg had changed, it had elongated and developed darkness at the top, I labeled that day one. FDR was keeping track of it for me, and I thought, okay, something's getting ready to happen because it's no longer that perfect little pearl. It is, it's changed. So we call this day one. Day two, voila, it hatched. And if you notice the tiny little caterpillar, and it is tiny, is crawling around on now the underside of a monarch or a milkweed leaf has got hair he's fuzzy and at this point the little tiny caterpillar can't even get down to the leaf it's walking on top of the hair the fuzz but it does eat that because it's hungry caterpillars are eating machines so day two into this metamorphosis our little tiny caterpillar is crawling around on top of the fuzz uh eating and it continues to eat. Here we're at day three. It's already, it's probably already molted its skin one time because now it's striped. It'll be striped the rest of its caterpillar life. It's now roughly one eighth of an inch. I decided maybe the FDR dime wasn't exactly, it was hard to judge the size of the dime. Uh, most of us don't even carry dimes in our pockets anymore. They're in a jar in the kitchen that it's just filling up with with loose change. But at this point, we're only on day three and it's already one eighth of an inch. Over the course of uh, its life as a caterpillar, it'll increase in size 2,000%. Uh, some sources say 3,000%. That's incredible. Uh, but they eat constantly. You know, this other little caterpillar has started to work on the leaf. It's chewed down little divots into the leaf. It's starting to take in. Now it's not reached the point where the milkweed um, sap is covering it up, it probably couldn't manage. It would be, it would, it be, itself would become so sticky with the milkweed um, uh, sap inside the leaf, but it is eating, it is eating. So this is day three. Let's move on to day four. Look at it now. We're already at a quarter of an inch. It doubled in size in 24 hours. This, and I decided I would start putting the dates just for the heck of it. This is Sunday, June 23rd. And it's already eating its way through the leaf. You can see some of the milk, uh, the, uh, the toxins that go around the leaf, but it doesn't care. Uh, my job was to document it and keep it supplied with fresh leaves, which I did. Again, I didn't sit and watch it the entire time. I would just be walk past it and look and say, my goodness, you're eating like crazy. Uh, where are we at now? Day six. And you can see from the milk weed, milk weed leaf how many tiny little divots it's made all through there. Uh, it's working on the leaf. It'll get to a point where it can eat an entire leaf in a day. So this is day six, roughly a week after it hatched. Where are we at now? Day seven. Okay, this is a week after we hatched. That's a fresh leaf. I think I just put it on. And it's grown in size to be three eighths of an inch. By now, it's probably molted its skin again. Insects, as they grow, are a lot like snakes. They have to shed their ectoskeleton, their skin, because it's too tight. And so they shed it. The period between the sheds is called an instar. And the caterpillar, uh, monarch caterpillar, goes through five instars uh, before it's ready to move on in life. So. This is, I'm guessing, its second, maybe its third instar, uh, which sheds its old skin and it promptly eats it because it's full of protein. So you don't find the skins laying around. So we're at a three eighths of an inch one week after we just saw it hatch. Whoa. I brought FDR back into the picture. Uh, now you can say, well, I kind of remember how big a dime is, and now it's almost as long as the dime is tall. This is day eight. You can see the product of its work on the side. It's eating that much of the leaf, and literally they do eat constantly, virtually. They do stop and rest, and they do stop to molt because their skin gets so tight. But that's day eight. FDR is doing a good job there. 
day 10. This is Saturday, June 29th. We're up to, if you stretch that, uh, little, if you stretched her out, and I did later discover it was a female, uh, it's going to be an inch long. And you remember the first photograph, it was barely an eighth of an inch long when I first used the ruler to mark. So here we are, day 10, Saturday, June 29th. I was amazed. I was absolutely amazed. Here again, I'm doing this to document it. I wanted to photograph the process. I wanted to see it happen. Uh, that's one of the beautiful things about retirement. You can do these wonderful things you don't have time to do otherwise. Uh, here we're at day 12, Monday, July 1st. Probably stretched out. It's certainly over an inch and a quarter long. You can see the leaf that had just finished eating. It's virtually gone. The head is on the uh, end of the ruler. It's the tentacle, you can easily tell the tentacles are much uh, longer on the head end. Those are really tentacles. They're not actually antennae. Uh, but we're at day 12, July 1st. Day 13, July 2nd. Wow. Now we're getting close to over an inch and a half long. Uh, if I tickle it and had it to stretch a little bit more, it might almost make two inches. We're at day 13 since we started documenting this process. Uh-oh, something magically happens. Around day 14, and it can change because the temperature, if it's a warmer day, if, it's a, if we're going through a warm spell, this whole process goes faster. If we're going through a cooler spell, it's a little slower, but we're only talking a matter of hours or days. Here we are at day 14, or two weeks after the after I took the first photograph of the egg that has just started to change. And the caterpillar has lost its interest in eating. It's roaming. It started to roam around, started to crawl around. It was like, okay, I'm done. I'm full. I'm ready for the next part of my life. And what I did, I created um uh, kind of a dried arrangement of dead sticks in a vase. You could call it maybe an Adams family uh, centerpiece, just sticks, or maybe a Munster centerpiece, but it was just sticks, and the caterpillar was just crawling around the sticks. It's just roaming. It's going out to see the world, kind of out, out in adventure, using some of that uh, energy that's built up of all the eating. It would get to the end of one of the sticks and go, nah, this isn't right. This isn't right. This is, again, July 3rd. It would kind of sense, I didn't know exactly what it was looking for, that je ne sais, je ne sais quoi it was trying to find, but that wasn't it. Eventually, here at um, 1 o'clock in the afternoon on July 3rd, the same day, it stopped. It didn't move. It stopped roaming at that spot. And I'm sitting there going, wonder what, what's going on here? It just stopped. Was it tired? Was it going to roam some more later? It just stopped. This is 1.32 in the afternoon. I shot all of these uh, with all the fancy cameras I own. I shot all of this on my cell phone. And I love that because it dates it in times every single photograph. And so this was 1.32. I was not sitting there rapidly noting all of this the, the phone was recording the date and time and but it had stopped it kind of froze it kind of stayed there its head's on uh, on the left side its rear ends on the right side and it seemed to be content there or maybe it was just resting so I just kept watching it not continuously I would get up and move around uh, maybe do my laundry maybe walk to the mailbox things like that I came back in here at almost five o'clock in the afternoon the same day. It seemed not to have moved at all. But then I looked and said, wait a minute. Before the head was on the left and the rear end was on the right, it's completely turned around. But it's in roughly the same spot. What's it doing? <laughs> Is it surveying the property? What's it doing? Uh, it had really just reversed, and it stayed that way for a while. But then I noticed it wasn't completely dormant. This is July 3rd at 5.49 p.m. It was, its head was gyrating back and forth, back and forth, and it was weaving a little pod of silk 
uh, back and forth, back and forth, or sovereign, as some people call them, a button. Uh, it really was just uh, silk being woven into uh, uh, something to hang on to, really. But that's uh, it's it's there with its true legs. The spinneret uh, for the uh, caterpillar is just below its mouth. It's not on its rear end. It's just below the mouth. And so here it was spinning, 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 spinning. And I it really became kind of interesting at this point. What's going on there? What's going on? New photograph. This is about seven o'clock at night, same day, July 3rd. If you look, it has turned around again. The head is now back on the left and the rear end is back on the right. What? It's incredible. What is going on? Well, what was going on, if you, um, caterpillars really have, in, well, insects have six legs. Caterpillars have six true legs that are up by the head. That's what you're seeing kind of hanging on. And the others are called prolegs or cross legs. They're really more muscle. Uh, they're part of the ectoskeleton. They're really part of what anchors the caterpillar to where it's at. It really doesn't help that much with uh, motivation of moving around. And the hind set uh, prolegs are slowly grabbing on to that piece of silk that it has woven there into the little tiny pad or button. Here we are at eight o'clock. And the evening, the same day, July 3rd, if you notice in the photograph, uh, the true legs have released. They're longer, longer holding. And only the second set of pro, uh, pro legs back is holding in the center of the caterpillar. And way in the back, the hind uh, pro legs, the last two pro legs, they are the ones gripping that piece of silk that it just wove. This is incredible. This is incredible, and it's happened right there, happening right there for me to watch. Boom, at nine o'clock at night, it eventually drops, and it's only holding itself up by the last two pro legs. They're not true legs, they're kind of clasping on at this point to the, uh, uh, the button of silk. I think scientists call this the hanging J. I have no idea where they get that name, <laughs> hanging J. Truthfully, it hangs like that for hours, just in a J shape. And here we are at nine o'clock at night on July 3rd. July 4, nine o'clock uh, the next morning, still hanging there. So for 12 hours, it's been hanging in the J. I get up, I get, I get up so excited, I didn't know what would happen. In fact, I think I, I, I slept partially near it so I could watch during the night to see what happens in case I'd missed something. I made my coffee and I'm sitting there watching this. Other people are out. It's July 4th. They're celebrating Independence Day. They're barbecuing. And I'm sitting watching this caterpillar hanging upside down in a J shape. It's like, okay. Then I notice the front end of the caliper, and you can see easily there, the six true legs that are right behind the head. It was starting to swell a bit and change colors. At this point, the tentacles are more or less hanging useless. They're, they're attached to the ectoskeleton, no longer being needed. And uh, so I thought, uh-oh, something is truly getting ready to happen. It eventually dropped almost to a true vertical position. This is 10 o'clock the next morning, still July 4, hanging down, tentacles useless, just hanging limply. It started to split. It started to split through the ectoskeleton of the pupa underneath. This is this portion called pup pupation. It's great. It's becoming a pupa where a little change. So it's splitting off its skin. And it's having to wiggle out, hanging upside down, wiggle. And it, I, I should have shot some video. I wasn't, next time I will, if I get a chance. But it wasn't just hanging, it was gyrating. It was wiggling, it was moving. It's a lot like, if you can imagine trying to take off a pair of tight-fitting jeans hanging by your feet and not using hands, because they don't have hands. So you're really just kind of wiggling it. Against gravity, you've got to push it up. And ectoskeletons fit very snugly. This is uh, 10-11, July 4. 
uh, it's still wiggling, it's still moving, it's still gyrating, trying to get the skin off. Uh, it's worked its skin up uh, about halfway off and gyrating, wiggling. You can already see what will ultimately become the wings uh, on the side. So uh, inside the chrysalis, and that's where we're headed to, the, the adult butterfly has already been there in tiny imaginal cells, tiny groups of cells. Even the caterpillars, photographs we were looking at earlier, there were clusters inside that caterpillar that will ultimately become the proboscis, the wings, the legs. Now you can see, oh, wow, that's an abdomen, and that's the wings, and the wings are attached to the thorax. Um, again, here we go. We're almost getting the ectoskeleton off. It's really trying to work it, work it, work it, work it, as you would be too, if you're getting those genes off. Just sit there and think about that. That's, that's difficult to imagine. We get to this wonderful point here. It is still hanging on for dear life with the prolegs, those final two prolegs, but the prolegs are part of the ectoskeleton that's going to be cast off. You notice all the other prolegs are gone. They're in the, they're in the dead skin, essentially hanging there. Something magical has to happen here. It happens very, very quickly. If I'd have known what to look for, I would have had the magnifying glass. I didn't know what to look for until it was all over. But at the end of the um, pupa, there's a tiny black stem uh, called the Craymaster. And the end of that tiny black stem has got tiny little hooks. It's like Velcro. So at this point, it's got to release its prolegs and jab the prey master and all of those tiny hooks into the silk pad and cling for dear life. And you can get there. If you look there, the skin is about to drop off. And if you look at the end of the pupa, there's the prey master, a tiny black stem that is only needed for this incredibly important job of uh, hanging on to that silk pad for a matter of days. And the caterpillar is gyrating, trying to push that stem as deep as it can into that silk uh, button. Boom, we've lost the skin, it fell to the ground, no longer needed, and is literally again holding itself here at 10.13 in the morning, holding itself by the craymaster into the, uh, jabbed up into the silk. And it's got to hang on there. Uh, for the rest of the time, it's a pupa. The pupa starts to contract and get smaller. But again, looking at that, uh, you can see through the, uh, the interesting thing, the final exoskeleton that contains this is transparent. You can literally see through it. And what you're looking at is the formation of the wings. You're looking at what will ultimately be the abdomen of the butterfly. This looks nothing like a butterfly at this point. But the whole uh, pupa is starting to contract into its final shape, its kind of famous shape. Smaller, smaller. So here we're at 1038, uh, July 4th, 30 minutes after pupation started. We're starting to look more like a final chrysalis. Boom. Five, five hours later. This whole process took five hours. And here I'm watching it jumping up and down screaming. I'm like a 10 year old boy again. Oh my gosh, I need to call everybody I know. Come over, come over, you gotta see this, you gotta see this. It will hang like that. Now here we bring, I brought FDR back in one more time to get a sense of the size of the chrysalis. That final ectoskeleton, the, the, uh, the shell, if it were, uh, has now hardened to protect uh, the pew inside. The ring of gold spots are really a breathing air holes because inside there, there's some notion that inside there, it just looks like green toothpaste. But no, inside there is a beating heart. Inside there, it is breathing. It takes in air through those tiny little dots, uh, air holes that have the, no one's quite sure why they're tinged in gold, probably to camouflage it some way. And here, a photograph through in detail. I slipped off part of the branch so I could get in closer. But this shows you looking into the transparent chrysalis the cray master that's holding on to the silk pad where the abdomen will ultimately be, the spinnacles, that's where the breathing air holds. You can see the uh, proboscis, the legs, the two eyes of the ultimate butterfly 
and the thorax and the wings. That's what you see looking into the chrysalis. And the chrysalis is green uh, because insect blood is green. It's hemolymph, and that's it, the blood is green. So there's a lot of hemolymph that has to be reabsorbed. Cells have to be re uh, 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 rearranged to make the ultimate adult features. Boom, here we are. That's the final chrysalis that most of us studied even in grade school. Uh, it's incredible. It's, I had a friend that said she wanted to make jewelry out of these. Uh, and he's like, oh, that would be wonderful to have living jewelry. Now that it's headed to the endangered species list, that's probably a no-no. Here we are at day 24. This is nine days after pupation. We spent a long time on, pup on the pupation. This is nine days later. Uh, and we're starting to see an absence of the green. That green has been reabsorbed again. It's insect blood into the final adult parts. I got up early one morning, day 25. We're now three, uh, three plus weeks since the first caterpillar photograph, 10 days since pupation started, and you literally can see straight through. That's one of the miracles of all of this. The chrysalis shell is transparent. I sat there drinking coffee. I said, I'm not leaving you this time. I'm going to drink coffee after coffee after coffee. And I'm staying with you. Uh, roughly, what is it? Eight o'clock, about two hours later, I quite. Uh, again, what I was starting to see was a, a slight swelling at the bottom of the chrysalis. Again, you can, I, I never witnessed this. How is this butterfly born? And I was, here again, I'm jumping up and down. Ten, ten year old boy. How is it born? It's born head first. It, it pushes its way to the bottom of the chrysalis. The adult wing or adult legs it is you, it's using for the very first time are used to push open the chrysalis, to push it open enough for the butterfly to emerge from the bottom. But here again, gravity is working against it. It could easily fall to its death straight down if it doesn't hang on tight. The legs are moving around. The legs are moving around, trying to get a good hold of what will ultimately be just the empty shell, the empty chrysalis hanging there. Head is emerging. The legs are working. The legs are working. A, to push open the chrysalis enough for the birth to happen, and B, to hang on to it. Here, uh, we're at 8.59. This all started, what was it? It was at six, uh, around 6.19. Uh, we're about 9 o'clock in the morning on July 14th, 10 days after pupation started. The butterfly is working its way out. The legs are still working. And finally, woof, the abdomen swings down into place. And so now it's virtually all out of the chrysalis. The legs are still trying to make sure it's hanging on tight. Luckily, it's got six legs, but it's grabbing, grabbing, grabbing. And the, and the abdomen starts to pulsate, pulsate, pulsate. It's pumping those wings full of blood. It's, in, it's, in, it's inflating the wings. So as you're watching this, the abdomen is working. The wings are, the wings are getting bigger. The wings are getting bigger. The wings are getting bigger. And this, this all happens in a matter of seconds. We're still at 8.59. The caterpillar, look, its legs have got a good hold of the outside of the chrysalis. The abdomen is getting smaller as the wings are getting bigger. You can see the antennae have now inflated, and the butterfly climbs a little higher up on the chrysalis, mostly just to hang on. If it falls at this point, it's fallen to its death because it can't, wouldn't be able to fly. It doesn't have its wings going. We're at 9 o'clock. All of this has happened in seconds. It's absolutely happened in seconds. Uh, still again, 9 o'clock. Wings almost as big as the abdomen. I'm going to flash through here. We're about finished with our time. Uh, the wings are, are wet and damp at this period, but it is starting to look more like the mon. Oh, this is gorgeous. This looks like fine, beautiful drapery hanging somewhere. The butterfly is hanging on for dear life. Um, 903. 904. <laughs> this is how, yeah, again, it's all this part. The egg, the eating of the milkweed leaf takes forever, it seems like, but the, this part actually happens in seconds. 
boom, almost an adult looking butterfly, but the wings are still damp. And here's a full 10 minutes, only 10 minutes. This has taken 10 minutes to emerge from the chrysalis. And now it's hanging as an adult butterfly, uh, but it is, the wings are still wet. It typically takes about four hours for the wings to dry out enough. And you start seeing the butterfly move those wings back and forth. It takes roughly uh, four hours for the wings to get dry. Uh, And all of a sudden, it starts crawling around. It's not quite ready to fly at this point, but it's on the stick. It's on the same branch. It's working those wings. It's starting to flap. It's starting to move those wings. And so I, and you can tell from this photograph, it is a female, a female monarch butterfly. What I wanted to make sure to do is return it to the exact same place I had found the egg those uh, almost four weeks earlier. So I took it back. I set it on someone. I think that's bone set. Uh, back in the same muddy field, probably only a few feet from where I first found the egg, that was, that was that time later. Uh, now, if we had been at Tremont and caught the butterfly, we would have put a sticker on it, and that uh, shows you what the stickers look like that we put on when we're there with, uh, when we're volunteering at Tremont at Cades Cove. This is what we do in the fall. I think last year we tagged close to 1,000 butterflies there at Cades Cove. It's absolutely fun. The kids love it. And again, if I'd have been at Tremont uh, for all of this, I would have handed it uh, to a little girl or a little boy there so they would see the first flight of the butterfly from their hand, or sometimes we put it on their noses. Uh, I love the program at Tremont. I hope to be doing it again this fall. And that's it. Thank you. Now, if there are any questions. I think I've got 245. What? Favorite butterfly and favorite moth. That's a great question. Well, it's hard for me not to love and say a monarch is my favorite butterfly simply because I've lived with them. I've seen them. Otherwise, what I said earlier, I love zebra swallowtails. That's my goal for this summer is to find an egg and do the same process with it. Favorite moth it have to be luna moth. Everyone, I remember catching luna moths as a kid. Up, I grew up on Baskins Creek. Uh, road uh, in a house that no longer is there, burned down, but catching Luna moths under the street lights at night and just absolutely marvelous. So that would be mine too. Um, I'm thinking about raising moths. Do you have any recommendations? About raising moths? Get started. Uh, I've never done it. If I could find a Luna moth egg, I would do this exact same thing. Uh, you just have to get started doing it. And figure out the host plant. You have to supply the host plant. Everything, every, everyone has a different type of leaf that they will eat. How do you know the differences between the male and Ah, good question. Ah, boom, boom. And I didn't include a photograph of a male in this for some reason. Now, everything you saw was a female going through metamorphosis at the end. Uh, let me back up. Can I back up? Okay. If you look at this photograph here, or maybe then that's uh, Sarah Kate. Hey, Sarah Kate. We can do it with this. Notice the venation on both sides of the wing, the black lines in the orange. For a female, the, the lines are pretty bold and they're kind of uniformly thick. If that were a male, the venation, the lines are much thinner and there's two black spots that are on each wing, right on the center of the back wing. I wish I'd included, that's a great question. But you, that's where you look at, there's two black spots. That the, the venation is smaller, thinner, and there's black spots making a male. This has been a female the whole time. How do you tag them? Well, first you catch them. <laughs> It's the most wonderful thing. I'm so glad I'm involved in the program. Last year, there were 17 different volunteer facilitators that lead the groups, that teach the groups this whole process. First, you catch them with a net, a butterfly net, and then you very, very, very gently reach into the net and catch the butterfly by closing the wings and holding the wings uh, together. And as I said, you do it very gently and then 
it won't let me go backward. Okay. You see that one cell. Okay, notice the way I'm holding. That is my finger. Uh, it's actually my whole hand. Anyway, um, wow, it's nice to know that they're connected. Uh, you're holding the butterfly wings gently together so it can't flap. And again, you're doing this very gently. But you have to hold it well enough it will fly away. And there's that one cell. And again, this is a female as well. There's that one cell that really, and by cell, the cells are the orange uh, uh, portions between the venation. Uh, there's one cell that kind of looks roughly like a mitten, and that's where the sticker goes. The sticker, uh, this was all worked out years ago by uh, Nora and Fred Rubach, Canadians that started the process of trying to figure out where the monarchs uh, migrate to. And they worked out the whole system and the numbers. So each monarch gets tagged, gets its own individual number, and there's a, a, there's a cell phone number or a website on there. If you happen to find this monarch later, you let them know where you found it. But each monarch is labeled with its own. It's kind of like putting a, a, a tagging a bird by, by giving it a leg band. It's got its own number, and that number is registered. What we do as facilitator is write down where it's caught, when it's caught, male or female, and its number. And if that turns up anywhere, and, I, and occasionally a butterfly, a monarch will turn up in Mexico that was tagged in Cage Cove. Um, are crystals always green or clear? Whoa, I love that question. It's a question I don't know because I love the ones I don't know the answers to. Are they always transparent? Is the shell? I honestly don't know. I'll have to do research. Now, we did see two examples of that here, but some may not be. I would have to, an educated guess is they're always clear, but that's just an educated guess. I'm probably, with 17,500 species of butterfly on the planet, I'm sure I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm sure I'm dead wrong. <laughs> but with monarchs, yes, they're clear. Uh, some moths appear to be wearing leg warmers. Is that an adaptation? Say it again. It's just that, like, wow, <laughs> they, yes, they have hairy legs. It's just an adaptation. It's just a way they've evolved. Gosh, would it be for warmth? Maybe the moths are nocturnal. Maybe the ones that evolve further north where it's colder at nights need a little extra warmth. That's a great question. I don't know it. I will be looking it up when I get home. How long do butterflies live? Well, the only one in the we're real kind of sort of expert on, kind of sort of expert, is a monarch. Monarchs are wonderful in that they live four generations, uh, maybe five. They're still kind of work that number out. Uh, the first, third, uh, the first, second, third live roughly two months. We've seen the first month of their life, they go through metamorphosis. Uh, and then the second month of their life, maybe a little more, they're adults uh, that have to find each other. The males and females find each other, and the females lay their egg. So that's roughly two months, maybe a little more. So that's generation one, two, three. Generation four, maybe five, and they're still, the jury's still kind of out on this one. The last generation of monarchs, every year, they are really not interested in reproducing. They're different. They're kind of a super group. They migrate. They want to move south for the winter. And we now know it's it's well documented that they migrate all the way to uh, to the mountain ranges of Mexico. It's there that the males and they overwinter, so they live eight months. If you're born, you have a long flight, two three thousand miles. You go all the way to Mexico and you spend the winters, and it's there that the males and females start noticing each other. It's there that their hormones start to uh, ramp up and they start thinking, well, okay, maybe uh, uh, it's time to migrate back. They do migrate back and they usually start arriving in this country in March. You can go to Journey North. That's a website and type in monarch. And every spring they start documenting monarch butterflies as they start appearing uh, first along the Gulf Coast and working their way up towards Tennessee. But right now, they're all in, uh, the bulk are in Mexico. There's a few that overwinter in very South Florida down into the Caribbean. Last question. Do you have to keep the monarch bathed at certain temperatures for permission? 
The question was, do you have to see, keep the monarch egg at a certain temperature or humidity? Uh, now they're asking us not to do monarchs. Uh, now that we know that monarchs are dropping in numbers by such a huge amount, down 80% in 15 years, they're asking us to let nature be let nature be along with monarchs. That's another reason I'm trying to focus on other on other insects uh, and get a sense of other numbers too. But when I did my experiment, I was new at it. I was just starting, and I kept them indoors. That's now considered a really bad no-no because that was a it was a warmer temperature and a different humidity than it would have outdoors. If I could turn back the clock, and none of us can turn back clocks, or I would be the first to do it, uh, I should have kept it on my screen in porch where it had a, 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 it had a sense of day and night, day and night. But again, they're asking us not to do any hand raised monarchs. Uh, they're in trouble. We uh, shouldn't be doing it, but there's plenty of other butterflies we can start practicing on. Okay? I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.